everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. We're big, we're bad, and we're back with a part two interview with our good friend, Mr. Elliot Randall. Elliot, how are you? I'm very well. I'm pleased to be with my favorite interviewer. Ah, oh, okay. You got. No, you I mean it. I mean it. You obviously got my check. How have you been? Very well, thanks. Very well. I'm, you know, moving forward with new projects. Well, here we go. Here's the big plug. Uh, I'm teaming up with my friend who is a, a wonderful painter, artist, a guy called Ruby Mazur, who a lot of your audience may know from, he's the guy who did the Rolling Stones, Tongue and Lips. So we're embarking on a project, which we hope to be able to sell off via NFT. This seems to be the way a number, well, certainly the visual artists have got it together. Um, the audio artists are starting to twig to it a little bit. And um, it's wonderful. He's done, he's done a lovely portrait of me. And I'm supplying him with the music. Now, the music is, <laughs> wait for it. It's my own version of Reeling in the Years that I did in the early 2000s. It's got an incredible array of people on it. I've got Chuck Rainey and Bernard Purdy, my rhythm section. And you know the part that goes that 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 that. I've always heard that with a Celtic bent to it. And so I got hold of my Irish crew, uh, Bill Whelan, the fellow who composed River Dance, put me together with three incredible trad musicians. So we were able to pull off that mixture of, you know, traditional Irish into a real reeling in the years. We've got Tasman Archer singing, and she's just absolutely wonderful. She's got a, a voice like honey. Uh, Hamish Stewart did, and I did the background vocals. It's a reimagining of what they did. I certainly didn't want to do it as a cover. You know, that would be like, well, why? Did you do the original melody in the chorus or the way Steely and Dan have been doing it recently? Because I just heard a live thing from a few years ago. Instead of doing the day, they've been drilling in the years. Da, 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 da. I know it's really, I know it's a subtle difference, but it was just like, I missed a da, 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 da. I missed, missed that movement. I don't know if that's the way they're doing it every night. I mean, certainly when I performed with them, it sounded like the real original. And it might have ah, to do okay. with how the sound's being mixed. Because there's basically seconds, years, years, right? So you have yeah. a B, A, and if they're both going at the same time, it's like, whoa. Maybe somebody, maybe it was just the, the mix I heard. Yeah, yeah, could be, could be. Interesting. Well, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Where can we see here this? We're still putting it together. Ruby's finished with the painting. I'm finished with the recording, because obviously it's been finished quite a while. We're putting them together. And he has some really nice connections with the NFT community. He's already been quite successful at selling one of his pieces. So you said to me, just as we got on the call, you said we had only been through the first page of the questions I sent you. Uh, and we did have two and a half pages of questions. Let's go back to those questions. So you played on the album Arena by Asia mm -hmm. in 1996. And you're even credited as a, as a band member. Well, it's funny. I mean, the only original real band member at that point was Jeff Downs, who I totally love and idolize. I think his playing is absolutely brilliant. His, synth his synthesis is brilliant. His piano playing is brilliant. And then there was another fellow, basically made the phone call and said, would you like to come and you know, play with Asia? That was John Payne, who's got his own little Asia outfit out now going, happening over the Western United States and elsewhere. Rock cruises, I think. You know, the answer was sure. And I loved it. Asia, when I was in it, never really got past the studio. So there were no live gigs. But it was a wonderful experience. You know, it's quite the challenge because some of the compositions are like really demanding. And I love that stuff. I love it when somebody, you know, pushes me over the line a bit. Yes, Asia definitely um, is more, how can I express it? You know, more European classical influence than blues influence, would you, would you I would, say Yes, that? I think that's true. I think that's true. I think part of what really worked for them was me bringing a little bit of blues into the more proggy stuff that they were doing. I love prog. I mean, it's hard to say that there's any music that I don't like. I, there's some really great rap stuff as well. So, you know, it, it depends on what you're listening to, what your mood is. 
what your taste is. Uh, and I, you know, I try to keep an open mind for all that stuff. So this next question is definitely a uh, obvious fan question. What is your proudest guitar? I mean, I, I said guitar solo moment, but you know, what's your proudest guitar playing moment? It doesn't have to be the obvious. Oh, that, that's a tough one because it isn't the obvious. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm Good. very proud of the stuff that I've done that's gone mainstream. There are a few moments where I'm a little, dare I say, embarrassed about little bits and pieces. I'll let you know one of those in a minute. But I don't think there's any one in particular. You know, it's there. I've done, I dare say, thousands of sessions and walked away with hundreds of great moments and hundreds of less than great moments. I think... What would make me most proud as, as a hired session musician is, A, being able to say, yeah, I did that. And the other is being able to say it to yourself, to go home and be really delighted by what you were able to contribute to a song. I think there's not a single Steely Dan tune that I've played on that I wouldn't feel really, really proud of. But I've had other moments, too. You know, there was this, <laughs> I did a, a recording many, many years ago. Warren Schatz was the producer. The original Turn the Beat Around, Vicky Sue Robinson. And it's really funny because when you look at the 45, it says guitar solo by Elliot Ranth. And I'll think to myself, I never did a guitar solo. <laughs> uh, but what it was, was the, I listened to the piece and I said, there's not very much I can give you here, Warren. So why don't I, I have an idea. Let me tape my strings up with gaffer tape and run it through the most extreme setting on a Mutron biphase and play, you know, some sort of rhythmic figure that worked with the rhythm set, the percussions, and you know. So I did that, and it worked really great. And the guitar solo that he mentioned was they basically dropped out most of the instruments and I'm still going, chuk, 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 chuk. So, you know, but that's a moment I really, really treasure. In, in fact, I remember Gloria Estefan coming over to me a couple of years after she did hers. And she said, we really liked that. We thought that was really, really great. I was like, oh. Do you feel more creative in a studio situation or, or a live situation? Ooh, that's a loaded question. I feel equally at home in both places. And both places give you different opportunities. In a recording studio, you could, if you really needed to, do a do-over or 10 do-overs or 20 or 100. Um, if you're on stage, there's no do-overs. It's that moment. And I think you have to, in some ways, acclimate yourself. If you're going to be a performer on a constant basis, not every note you go for, you're going to get. Sometimes you may play a couple of embarrassing ones. You have to get over it. You have to say, well, okay, that's gone. That's a moment gone. Now we're in the now. We're in the present. So being able to pull off wild stuff on stage is a bit more of, a, of an adrenaline-producing thrill, I think. But they're both, they're both wonderful ways to go about it. Do you have this experience that... There's two moments back in the olden days when I used to play live where I played solos that weren't recorded and they just felt like, oh my God, that where did that come from? That was just inspirational. I didn't I, I just felt like it was and and I wish I could bottle that up and remember it and know it. And maybe that's is that part of the excitement of playing live that you just don't really know where it's gonna go until Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to me, the answer is yes. There are a lot Good. of other guitar players who are much more regimented. And I don't say that as a criticism. You know, uh, uh, my friend Steve Howe, for example, I, I remember going into his dressing room and he's in there, note for note, note for note, everything perfect. And it was a wonderful show. But that ain't me. That's Steve. You know, with me, I have no idea what the next note's going to be unless it's really prescribed by the artist. Um, so I love the seat of the pants playing, is what I would call it. After our interview, the first one, and then, of course, the, the video on the song, um, Reeling in the Years, 
there was a lot of people asking questions about Roger. So even though it's not in my original questions list, mm. I mean, give, give me, I'd love to know more about working with Roger Nichols. I mean, what was your first recording you ever did with him? It was reeling. Oh, that was the first time you ever worked? Yeah, worked? yeah, yeah, yeah. We worked together a lot on projects other than Steely Dan as time went on. What was really interesting about Roger is other than his apparent genius and, and unbelievable sense of humor, was that he was a really warm fellow and you knew that he was part of the task that he was taking on for himself was to do the very, very best job possible so that whoever his client was would go, hey, I really like that. That's, that's great. You did a great job. And, and that taught me something as well. You know, I was like, yeah, this is, this is a really good working ethos. Interesting story about Roger when we were cutting some Steely Dan tracks up at River Sound, which is Donald's old place uh, in Manhattan. Um, I remember walking in one day and there was just so much gear in the control room. Why? Because they were recording analog on two different machines. They were recording digital on three or four different machines. And the idea was which one of these s sets of sounds is gonna make Donald and Walter happiest. And God bless them, they could afford to do it. So, you know, it's great. What record was it, do you remember? It was toward the end. So it would probably be Gaucho. I didn't plan the record, but I came by, you know, a fair amount. So. One of the things about your playing that stands out with, with, with Stilly Dan's stuff, and obviously we all know St Stilly, Dan, Stilly Dan probably has more great guitar players play with them than any other band in history. Um, but one of the things that massively stands out is the fact that, you know, like you said, there's there's a, a funk to it, but there's also a huge amount of blues. So wh when did the blues come into your life? Uh, the blues has been there forever. I mean, it, even in terms of Steely Dan, I would say that even some of the stuff I did on, on Reelin, you know, really lent heavily on a pentatonic presence, even though the, 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 the chords themselves were flat seven to one, flat seven to one. It just, it, it made it easy. And they were always prompting me because they, they liked the way I played bluesy things. And I may have told this before or not, um, but before every take, once we got past the first album, either Donald or Walter would literally, and it became a, like a, a running joke, would come over to me. I'm sitting ready to play and they go, Elliot, just play the blues. And I would always know that as I'm about to start, you know, working on a solo, one of those guys was going to point me back to my blues roots. So who were the players? Who were the blues players that, that inspired you? Isn't it funny that you should say that? I kid you not. Um, when I got into playing professionally, the style of music that I most related to was rhythm and blues. A term Jerry Wexler coined back in the 60s when he was working at Billboard. You know, you'd have that Steve Croppery stuff, you know, playing in six and just beautiful, beautiful bluesy stuff within the context of rhythm and blues. And it wasn't until hmm, the scene days, I think it was, which, uh, which would be about 67, 68, a good friend of mine was playing bass for um, Albert King and invited me to come down to the scene to see them. And I just went, whoa, this guy's coming from another place. You know, it was much simpler. It was just heartfelt from the first note to the last. And from that experience, I got into guys like B.B. King. I got into, uh, gosh, one of my favorites was um, Robert Lockwood Jr. I got turned on to him on from, from a... A piano record, the album Otis Spann is the Blues. And he had only one other side man, one side man with him, and it was Robert Lockwood Jr., or Robert Jr. Lockwood, as some people like to call him. Um, and it was inspirational. He just, he knew what to play. He didn't play one excess note, but everything he played worked for what was going on in the music. So he became an absolute inspiration. Um, Incredible. As far as the white players who emulated the black players, and I'd like to think that I'm not one of them, but I suppose I might fall into that category 
in some ways. The stuff that came out of England didn't really kill me a whole lot. Sorry, Eric, and, you know, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> I like Jimmy Page a lot because Jimmy was an original and he wasn't really a blues, blues player to me. But, you know, I think a lot of the English rock players got their stuff listening to loads of old legendary American blues players. I remember when I was on Polydor back in 1970, they gave me this whole big box full of um, blues records. And they all had a brown, almost looks like a brown paper bag label. You know, it was meant to be part of this series of old, old. And it wasn't uninteresting, but I can't say that I walked away learning a whole lot. And I don't mean that disrespectfully to the players, but it just wasn't where my focus was. So I'd already, you know, sort of gotten my taste of the blues and just sort of proceeded in my own way. I don't think anybody could call my blues playing, he sounds like such and such. They might say it for a couple of, a couple of notes or, or licks, but not on the whole. I, I, I prefer to think of myself as, as an originator. I think Bo Diddley said that once too. <laughs> In the gigs you've done, how often is reading something that, that comes up? Is it is it more like... Hey, uh, we want it to be a la, you know, give you an idea or funky, bluesy, rocky, this, that, the other. Or, well, or, or I, over the years, have you found a lot of, you know, sheet music thrust in front in, in, in front of you? Yes to all of those. Um, <laughs> no, no, you, you'll get stuff where somebody will come in without a chart. You get yep. stuff where somebody will come in with, you know, something nicely laid out where it's just the chords and it's the, the proper sequence. You know, it doesn't say go back to letter B when it, there should be a repeat sign, to, that kind of stuff, to stuff that is intricately written out. Oh, there's a, there's a third as well, which is the thing called simile. So Charlie Colello used to do this a lot. He'd go, ba, 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 da, ba, da, ba, ba, da. But he didn't want us to do that. He said, play a simile to it. This is the idea, but you take it where you want it to go. I had another client whose name I, I, I better not say, um, had a wonderful, uh, he'll probably watch this this, uh, this show, um, a really great jingle house in New York. I remember one day feeling maybe a little too frisky, maybe a little too, if you know what I mean. Um, and I looked at the chart, and it was just black with notes. And I looked up and said a little too loudly, I said, oh, my God, I think the fly had diarrhea today. <laughs> that was the last time I ever worked for them. <laughs> oh, so ouch. the things you learn as you go through life, you know, if I'd only kept my mouth shut, but there you go. Mm -hmm. Young, wise guy. Oh, I can, I can give you 101 reasons why musicians get fired. I don't know if that would be uh, at the top of my list, <laughs> but, but definitely one of those. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's this personal place where if – if your client feels insulted, which was the case, you know, it wasn't like I was playing horribly. I just made this rather off-color remark. I had a drummer once who had been uh, badgering me for a number of years to do to hire him on a session, and I was I'm always been you know at that point I was hiring Victor and Drizzo and, and Blair Center regularly, two of the busiest and best drummers in town. And um, he's badgering me, badgering me, badgering me. So I get this, this project come through where I'm going to engineer, um, and, but the producer really didn't know anybody, any musicians. He was more of the songwriter she was taking on. So I knew he was going to do a lot of heavy lifting. I was going to have to get the musicians booked. I was probably going to have to produce a lot of the session, you know. So I think, you know what, I'll try this guy out because he says he's, I've heard some of his work, so I bring him in. And uh, he plays all right. He's, he's a little bit, lots of opinions. You know, you just kind of want to just play the parts instead mm -hmm. of, you know, but whatever. So I go to the bathroom and then when I come back, he's giving this client of mine his card, telling him that he has his own drum room and his own studio. And next time, just to call him. <laughs> Ooh. That was the last time I've ever hired him. The first and only time I've ever hired him. And whenever his name comes up in conversation, I tell people the story. I'm like, it's just not worth the risk. I mean, no, you know, you, no. it, it, 
you know, you work hard to build relationships and then somebody tries to be opportunistic about it. Yeah. You know? I mean, if somebody likes what you do enough, they'll call you anyway. You know, the idea of trying to cut somebody else's workflow, it's just not kosher. It's silly. Yeah. It's silly. I mean, the, the best musicians, as you know, are the ones that come in and do an amazing job with as little fuss as possible and make everybody feel really good. You're talking and about people like, like Hugh McCracken and David Spinoza. Yep. John Trope. Yep. Yeah, I mean... And yourself. Thank you. But a part of our job is to make our... I, I use the word client, you know, for lack of a better word. We want them to feel good. We want them to feel like they really got their investments worth. And uh, to this day, I'm, I still do that. I think we covered this a little bit in the first one because we did talk, of, of course, about your famous strap, which I see plugged oh, yes. in over there. There's the strap. Yeah. It was sitting here because I'm actually working on a project for a new client. And he asked me to do something mm -hmm. that was somewhat akin to the green earrings bit that I did. And so this is the guitar that I used. And I thought, well, let me see what I can do. And I'm in the middle of doing it now. So, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> clean sound, obviously. Let me get a, a slightly funkier sound here. This is my H and K, my 18 watt Hughes and Kettner. you play these days are you find yourself still practicing stuff or are you just playing oh i have to practice yes yes um what, what do you practice can you before you put the guitar away I'd, I'd like to know what are the kinds of things you practice i'm a guitar player too i want some tips here okay developing your muscles it's much like going to the gym to work out so the first exercise that i give them is a chromatic exercise starting on the low e and going up to the G sharp over here. So it would be. The tricky bit is doing it all down, up, down, up, down, up, because when you get to the next, to the A string, you, go, you start picking up as opposed to down. And you do it like that, then you do it as. And then you do it as triplets, and so on, and and all the way through. All right, there's this wonderful exercise from Mel Bay, Book One, that I still absolutely love, and it's it's a, it's about getting your fingers stronger. And so you would go F and G on the E string. And you hold your fingers where they are, and then C sharp, D sharp. And your fingers really are forced to recognize that they're holding down a note and not to not to pick it up again. You know what I mean? Now there's a series from it's either the Johnny Smiths method or the George Van Epps method that starts out with it you're starting with a D chord or a second form chord and you go and you go up to fret so it's I'll send you the the, the various charts that I've written out 
And working with this position, you then go into starting on the fourth string. So his then back. And one of the things that Sal would, was really, really big on was the up and down pickup, picking rather. So that you really become used to being able to, it's kind of like running, you know, putting one foot in front of the other. Um, but the ultimate exercise from that one, and Sal said to, I think probably all of his students, if you come back next week and you, you can do this right, I will give you free lessons for a year. And it's this. Is that, you mean such... You get free lessons for a year. <laughs> All right, I'm calling you tomorrow. When are we starting? <laughs> we just started. <laughs> and then, and then there's, there's also the other um, sort of standardized, you know. Uh, and then, and then thirds. So it's all very, very pedestrian. But in its pedestrianness lies, to me, one of the keys of fluidity. And as you could probably hear, I'm not, I'm not at my most fluid right now. So what I do is I try to spend eh, between half an hour and an hour in the evening and do those exercises. Right, right. And it's not really bad. I mean... My students don't like it very much, but I've, you know, I've been doing it for so long. I find it really, really helpful, especially if I'm supposed to play a gig someplace and I'm not really as together technically as I would like to be. I'll spend three or four days just woodshedding for hours on end. And one doesn't need to keep doing that stuff that's boring. You know, I, I tend to, in the middle of my exercise regimen, I'll do something that just feels like fun. Bluesy stuff. I like to do Soul Twist by King Curtis. I like to do his, his also his Soul Serenade. You can't tempt me. You can't tell me about uh, these uh, things uh, and not show me. Okay. <laughs> this goes like. It is it's the soul serenade, you know. Um, yeah, it's gorgeous. And other times I'll just do stuff like... Just to sort of keep my, my funky mojo working a little bit. So between that and the legitimate exercises, it works out well. And I, I, I saw a lot of live stuff with you playing reeling. So that you, that you must have played that uh, several thousand times in your life. Probably. Um, <laughs> and it's funny because that's the one tune that I won't, with the exception of the very, very last, you know, the, the takeout chorus, I try to stay true to the record. Um, and it's the only one of my tunes that I, I really try to stay as exact as possible. Because I know that people have come, if, if it's a Steely Dan show, people have come to hear that that solo and they've come to hear those notes. So, you know, I'll be creative on another tune. So this is a question we've, we we talked about, obviously, mm. before somewhat in the first interview because we talked about guitars and, of course, your beautiful custom Strat. I mean, my question here was like, you know, what is your favorite electric and acoustic guitars? Um and I suppose there's lots of things like, do you prefer maple or rosewood or ebony? Or ah, good. Okay. Do you yeah, love it all? We can go there. I didn't used to love it all. I'm not sure I still, you know, would qualify as loving it all. Um, I've always loved rosewood necks. So my 63 Strat, um, which I think has an ash or an alder body, um, has got a rosewood neck. Absolutely adored. Um, my 
my uh, Martin D28. Also has a rosewood neck. I've always been a rosewood guy, you know, no matter what, whether it's acoustic, electric. The first time that I've actually owned a maple neck when Fred King guitars, are you familiar with them at all? That's um, Trev Wilkinson's designs. Um, right. Right. So they made this really nice Telecaster with a, with a maple neck. And I thought, mm, I'll give it a try. And does it have the warmth of my maple? Absolutely not. Um, it's something else. It's that, you know, that it's a real Telecaster sound. Um, and I, I've, I've come to quite like it a lot. Other than that, I'm not real, I'm not a big wood expert. So if somebody said to me, well, what are the differences between, you know, maple and hardwood? I, I wouldn't have a clue. Other than what my ears and my heart told me. To me, it's always been about warmth. So... Other people might say it's about clarity. Other people might say it's about grunge. You know, for me, it, there's a certain warmth that I grew up with that I'm, I'm still really quite locked into. Brands are brands. You know, if the guitar, as, as I tell anybody who's looking for a guitar, if it feels right and sounds right and plays right, it's right. And of course, it's good to have, you know, someone who knows what they're doing, a good luthier someplace who can help, you, help you out of jams. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in general, I mean, I don't do a whole lot of my own guitar maintenance, although I used to. I remember Jeff Baxter and I used to have contests over who could string our, our guitars the fastest. You know, it's, <laughs> it's gone well beyond that. Now I take my time. You know, it's it's um, it's just it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an acquired taste, I suppose. Um, amps Fantastic. amps to me are a whole nother story. Um, I grew up, my first, what I would call professional amp, 1963, I would have been 16 years old. I bought a Fender Concert, which was brown Tolex with a, with a uh, chocolate brown grill, four Oxford speakers in it. I think it had all of 35 watts. And I fell in love with it. And I've always loved Fender amps with 10-inch speakers. I said always up through the CBS acquisition or a few years afterwards. Um, the reason I like 10s is because 12s to me, and again, this is purely, you know, to each their own. There's a certain element of the low end that I've always felt personally bogged me down. So the 10s freed me up to be that much less conscious of the kind of sounds. I've gone from Fender to, well, these days, um, I've got that Usen Kettner here. Um, in the back, I have a Weinbrock. Now, there's this guy called Weinbrock, who was an American Air Force engineer, lives up in, yep. up in somewhere way up in North Yorkshire, and built these amps. And they're really good. They're based on the old basement prototype architecture. So that's why I like it. And we picked oh, two. Wow. Yes, and we we found two tens, not the same, that somehow together harmonically produced something that I think is really pleasing. Um, I've got my old Marshall um, Valve State eighty, which is the first issue of them. Don't go there now; it's not a good idea. But the old <laughs> the, the old ones, whoa, just fantastic, as warm as any valve amp. But there's only one valve in the amp, and that's for the overdrive channel. So it's all being done solid state. It's terrific. I remember when, when I first got it, I told Jim how much I loved it, Jim Marshall. And he said, tell you what, my boy, no matter where you are in the world, you call us here in Milton Keynes and we'll make sure you have one. Six months later, I'm in Australia. <laughs> I called the Marshall factory, Jim, I need one. And within 24 hours, there was one at my doorstep. And it's just, you know, that's... That's old school customer service that sadly, I don't that think- It certainly lot, is, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's not, I don't think a lot of the companies remaining or any of the new companies are particularly into that. But if they are, love them and hold on to them like they're a dream because they are. So I see, talking of Fret Kings, I see a Fret King Elise behind you. Ah, yes, yes. Tell me a bit about that. That's another, that's a winner. Um, this was the first of the Fret Kings that I ever really um, kind of got into. It feels very jazzy, 
And you know how they say you pick up an instrument and it makes you play a certain way? So this ja- this this thing makes me feel jazzier. And Trevor's pickups, again, you know, are just absolutely wonderful. It's, it's a lovely instrument. It really, really is. Um, I've put on a Fishman triple play, which is a MIDI generator, and it works within half of a cycle. So even if you're on your low E, it just picks yep. it up instantly. And it's amazing. It's brilliant engineering. And in fact, it was it was the Fred King folks who introduced me to Larry Fishman. Go figure. Oh, incredible. Um, so yeah, this thing does a lot of wild, wild sounding things that I wouldn't be able to do with, with a non-MIDI guitar. And I'm not huge into MIDI guitars, but if you can use them as a special effect, it's great. I mean, I'll do stuff where I'll record the guitar track and also record the MIDI track where I'm not having to listen to it and then come back and be able to enhance some of what I've done with the MIDI input that I've got. So there's all sorts of little silly tricks that one can dream up, I think. I think they're a beautiful looking guitar. They are. And so it's interesting because I, I, I was looking at one online and then when we first started the interview, I'm like, that's the guitar I was looking at. <laughs> mm. Well, you know what's funny is this here headstock through at first threw me because I thought, hmm, that's an imitation of a Fender, isn't it? And it's not a very good one at that. And then I realized I went to Serbia at a certain point. All of these old folk instruments have heads like that. So ah, it see. wasn't Leo's concoction. You know, it was, it's just from, from an old centuries old tradition of folk instruments. So talking of guitars, a natural thing to go on from here would be, I suppose, accessories like strings. Did you have a favorite string that you use, mm. manufacturer? I used to endorse the Dario's and they were like my go-to string. I've always used them for acoustic because of their bronze, phosphor, you know, really, really beautiful combination of ingredients. I remember being in a NAMM show early on, and they asked me if I'd be interested in um, endorsing their electric strings. And I said, well, actually, I, I quite like Fender strings. I really, you know, those are, those are my go-tos. And the guy started laughing. He says, who do you think makes Fender strings? I went, what? He said, yeah, we do. Oh, okay then. So they wound up sending me wonderful, you know, care packages, if you will, with strings and manuscript paper and all kinds of great things. That Didara is a really, really, really good company. They really, really are. And over the years, I've built relationships with other companies. Um, my contract with them ran out, and I could have asked them for more, but in the meantime, I had other people hitting on me. So. Um, Ernie Ball now make a product. I say now because I wasn't really enamored of them back in the early days. But some of their products, their string products now are fantastic. Um, and uh, I'm also working with Roto Sound, nice British company. Wonderful. Lovely folks. Um, and then here's a, here's a sad story about the whole at MI scene, the music industry scene. Um, there are companies that are alive for a year or two, and then for some reason, whether it's business or circumstance, aren't able to keep going through, you know, through the machine. They just have to break up. Um, there's a string called Kelvinators or something to that effect. The company is called Von York. Von York? Yes. And the strings themselves are called Kelvinite. And they are cryogenically treated nickel, blended, proudly made in the USA. Um, so a friend of mine who was a friend of the, the guy whose company it was, sent me an email. So I got a friend. Would you be interested in trying out his string? I said, sure, of course. They, so they sent me like two dozen, you know, a bo- two, two boxes with a dozen sets in each. They're bloody great. They last forever. They might be coated, but they're they were certainly frozen. That cryogenic frozen. frozen. Yeah. Oh, that's the so, cryogenic thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm putting them on my in, my instruments as we speak. You know, because it's time oh, for a string change for some of them. 
But it just shows you also that things can come and go in a flash. And it doesn't really have to do with the quality per se. It, it might, there are all sorts of factors that play into the success or failure of an instrument or an accessory or whatever, you know. Um, cables, I love Whirlwind. I think Whirlwind make the unbelievably great cables. Uh, and I was friendly with the owner for oh, quite a few years ago. And I remember that because I had a recording studio, so they used to send me like virtually miles of, of, of cable. And at one, and they, they made one cable, which I thought was really, really good. It really sounded different. And uh, a few months after my delight, I get a, 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 I think it was a call in those days, from the owner who says, Elliot, you got to send them back. There's something wrong with them. And what's the matter? He said, well, it was Mogami Cable. They said, well, there's, there's a little frequency drop in the cable between like 500 and 800 cycles. And I said, well, that must be why I really like them. So I'll use them for the guitars. And for everything else, for monitoring, I'll send you the rest back. And I still have some of them. They're wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So again, you know, a mistake can make something really super duper as well. This next question, I'm sure you saw, you saw this and thought, well, it's probably an hour and a half answer. And I, I wrote this question. It's like, can you talk about specific guitar techniques like whammy bar, using the volume control, uh, picks versus fingers, tapping, bending, and so on? Yes, Which I are can. The most which are most important you're playing, and do you spend a lot of time uh, practicing them? Well, I can give you the short answer. Um, Whatever you feel comfortable. On. Okay, I was brought up to pick. I, all of my, all three of my main tutors taught me how to pick, and uh, while I would have, for a while, said, "Well, I'm really just a picking kind of guy," I realized that it didn't take long for me to start using the other fingers over here to start supplementing what my picking was doing, whether it was as a harmony or, you know, for the sound effect of a chord, you can do like a trill with your three fingers, but I'm mainly a picker, picker and a grinner. So whammy bars at first as a, as a young up and coming, oh, this is great. And I kind of fell out of love with them for a while. Um, the Fender uh, whammy bars were awful. So I actually wound up tightening up all the springs in the back of my Strat and putting a wood block in so that if I did break a string, the whole thing wouldn't just go to hell. You know, in the old days, if you had them set up the way Fender set them up, you break one string, you're completely out of tune. Right. So, right. so I've opted out of whammy bars until I was introduced to a guy called Eric Stetz from Buffalo, New York. And he has a company called Stets Bar. Now, the whole physics of the way it works is different, right? He's got two springs and some other thing that goes flat on, on, on one surface to another. And, and you can go up and down. It's really smooth. It's terrific. I just don't use it very much because unless something is calling for a whammy bar, I'm not going to use it. And if I, you know, if I just pick up a, a guitar with a whammy bar, more than likely I'll start doing little sort of vibrato-esque things. Very, very subtle. So the whammy bar itself has to be really, really sensitive in order to pick up the subtlety. Right, so, right. So there's my plug for whammy bars, you know, my, my favorite <laughs> and probably the only one. No, that's not true. I have a whammy bar on my um, Music Man Albert Lee model. And it works really, really well. And it looks like a Fender design, but it just works a whole lot better. It's interesting. I never would have thought of Albert as a, as a whammy bar player. Well, indeed, indeed. But comes with a guitar, so there you go. <laughs> what a wonderful guitar player. One of my favorites, one of my absolute favorites. I call him the Duracell Bunny. He never <laughs> runs out of energy. He's just always full of it. He's wonderful. I, I met him at the NAMM show maybe five years ago. And I remember he's he's not very tall, so yeah, right. but he held out his hand to shake my hand, and his hand's like three inches <laughs> bigger than mine. He has the biggest hands I've ever of anybody I've ever show, shaken hands with. Like oh, That's about practice. No, he is. He is he's a wonderful player. Yeah. What kind of setup do you have at home for recording yourself? 
Well, all these various amps that I've been talking about. Um, but if I were to be really honest with you, which I will be, um, I find it just as easy and a bit even less, even easier to use a couple of plugins that I think really emulate amplifiers really, really well. And unless you're doing a solo piece in which you're the only instrument playing, once you start playing with other instruments, there's this sound cohesion. And it's one of these, I dare you to tell me if this is a pickup or uh, if, if this is a plug-in or if it's an amp. You know, um, the two companies that do them really, really great are IK Multimedia with their... Um, Amplitude. Amplitude, that's right. Amplitude 5 now. And the other is Waves. Waves make a thing called GTR, which looks rather simplistic. It doesn't have the same kind of cool gooey that, you know, that, that the IK one does. It sounds great. So, you know, that, a little bit of verb if you want it, maybe a little slapback. It's just, it's wonderful. And you're also, I mean, you're, when you're recording into a DAW, you're, you're not recording the plug-in. You're actually recording the sound of the guitar all by itself. So you can obviously change the sound any way you want afterwards. In some cases, I will actually reamp the sound where I'll pull it out of one of my outputs and whack it into a real amplifier and mic it. But at the end of the day, it's what's going to sound good in the piece of music that I'm making. I used to use a pig nose sometimes because it was really, really appropriate. So are you using amps at, um, in your room if you, or are you only using uh, virtual? I'd be lying if I said a combination because over the last year or two, it's been all plugins. What's your DAW? What do you, what do you use? Pro Tools is the main one. I have Logic. The reason I like Logic is because it's so wonderfully easy to manipulate MIDI in it. Um, the reason I hate it is because it doesn't do a long, a long line. For example, if you're going to repeat something, it does this thing where it, it, it's it's just it can be a nightmare as well. But that's fantastic. I, I do like it. You know, it, it, it's it's a, it's a good program. And then interface. What interface do you have? I have two. My main interface is the Pro Tools Quartet, which is basically an Apogee, made by Apogee. And, you know, the D to A, A to D sounds great. Sounds really, really good. Um, and the other one I have is a Focusrite, you know, two in, four out. Also great. Um, having said that, you know, as, as we spoke in the last episode, I do wear hearing aids, and there might be some stuff that's getting by me which is why I prefer to have an engineer around. And certainly when I'm doing Absolutely. mixes, you know, I have to have that. So, um, but both of them, both of them work great. There's, there's no, no real problems converting your analog sound into zeros and ones. Speakers, is there any particular speakers that you like? Uh, yeah, there's lots of them that I like. Some of the big Genelex <laughs> are very nice. Uh, I've heard some KRKs sound good. Um, I, I could, I, I've, I've been an old Tannoy user since the days when I used to come over here and there were Tannoy goals and stuff sitting in, you know, in the control room. So I have the more modern day ones, uh, that are self-powered and I can tell you the name in a second, 602s or 802s. You know, they give me the sound I want. Before that I was using a, a pair with a subwoofer and it was really nice, but these, will actually produce some of the lower frequencies that the subwoofer was producing. And there's an overall sound that I really, really like. And it feels true. It travels well from place to place. That's the most important thing. Headphones. Do you find yourself working a lot on headphones or are you mainly working on speakers? Uh, I try not to work with headphones if I can get away with it. If I'm sitting here all by myself and I'm going in direct and there's no real need. Um, and my two favorite kinds are buyers. And AKGs. These ones are 590 HDs. I grew up in, in, the, in a world where we used either buyers or AKGs. The AKGs that I used to get were um, 104s and 204s, I think they were. But again, you know, I'm not doing it for the utmost understanding of my mix. I'm just wearing it for the convenience of what I'm playing to. 
So if I'm playing at four o'clock in the morning, it might be a good idea to put earphones on. (laughs) So the economics of the industry obviously has changed. I said in the in the question I sent you, you know, you know, since the internet, but obviously it's just changed full stop. How has it affected the sort of work you do now? Presumably, obviously because of the pandemic, you're working, as you said earlier, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, completely remotely. Did you see a shift? You know, quite a dramatic shift over the years. Well before even that? Well, the industry has been on its way into the toilet since the early 80s. So economics is a, is, is a funny measure, if you will. I know what I can get. I know what I'm worth. I know that when a record company calls me up, I can say, this is what it will cost you. But, you know, I get a lot of calls from people who would like me to make, you know, to contribute to their record. And they're independently financed. So I could either, you know, be some kind of crazy, you know, uh, you know, insistent businessman and say, well, this is what I charge. I, I've learned to not do that. What I'll do now is ask a client what their budget is. And some will volunteer a very nice number. Others might volunteer a number that doesn't really work, at which point we can talk and say, well, this is the minimum I can charge you once I've heard the material and, and like it enough to work on it. But in general, for musicians, the economics is, is just, it's crap. You know, I know guys who were working in Florida in 1998 for 100 bucks a night, and they're working in 2021 for 100 bucks a night. Um, so the poor, you know, the poor sort of gigging musician has got a tough slog. As we talked about earlier, my quest now is to look at this NFT uh, possibility as it could, I say could, yield some really, really nice results. Now, I'm not looking to have, you know, a tropical island and uh, all, you know, all the cool things. I'm looking to be able to have two tropical islands. At least, (laughs) at least. And one of them would have a studio. Where do we go with this? You know, it's it's like, I just want to be creative. I want to be able to have the freedom. I actually sort of have it now, but if I had more freedom, i.e. more of 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 a sort of a cash pot, I might be able to hire more people to come in and do stuff with me. Um, and that, that's just it. I'm, you know, I, I'd like to think that I'm not a greedy guy. You know, I'd like to be able to, if I dream something, I'd like to be able to have it come to fruition. I completely relate to what you're talking about. The industry is, it's, it's sort of worse on a traditional sense, but better in a non-traditional sense. So it's sort of like, you know, people have access to you now. And so right. many of us that have worked sort of like in both mm. parts of the industry, it's like, what I like now is I work with independent artists that, uh, you know, pay me fairly well and pay me much quicker than I used to get paid by labels, mm. quite oh, frankly. God. I remember one label taking a year and a half to pay me for a week's work. I recently paid a session player for a gig that they never got paid on by the label. So I just wrote the check out myself. Uh, you know, it's, uh, there's so many of those stories. You know, I'm not alone in in, in, in that. I, I miss something about the old industry, but I also love something about the new industry. I'm sure you do too. You get to work on more varied projects and people send you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when I was doing my remake of Real in the Years, I did it all self-funded. I had some nice dough coming in at the time. So I went all over the world. It was, it was, I mean, it was a treat for me, you know, but I remember flying from New York down to Texas to get Chuck Rainey up to New York to get, you know, Mark Quinones, the Latin percussionist and Bernard Purdy. Uh, I flew over to Ireland to get my, uh, my Celtic players. I did some pre-production stuff in Florida. It was just all over the place. And I had such a good time, and I was able to pay people. I could say, well, what do you need? Okay, here's a check. Boom, there you go. And it made me feel really good because I know what it feels like to be on the other end of going, oh, am I going to be able to, you know. And you want to do for other people what you'd like other people to do for you. It's, it's not terribly complex. We touched on this a bit. Um, you obviously do quite a bit of teaching in the past, and, of course, you still teach today. Can you... Talk a little bit about the rewards and the challenges of that. And also, 
you know, do you have a methodology, a, uh, a, a curriculum, as it were, that you, you follow? If there's a curriculum that I have, it, it has to do with strengthening both your fingers and your mind. Students are a funny animal. Uh, if I were to teach them all from the same curriculum, I would lose half of them really, really quickly. I believe that every student has their own set of needs and their own interests. And one thing that Roy Smeck was great at with me was keep the interest going, keep them wanting to come back, not for the money, but keep them wanting to come back to expand their horizons, expand their their brains and their ability to improvise, to, to, to go places where no one has ever gone before. You know, those things thrill me. So I absolutely love teaching. I'm sort of gutted that at this point, um, I'm not doing one-to-one. I will, you know, as, as it opens up. And I don't like doing the Zoom stuff because as much as you can impart information, it's not being in the same room. There's, there's, this, uh, 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 there's an intimacy that gets lost. I like to be able to, if I see somebody sitting in a funny way, I'd like to be able to, 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 to subtly, you know, get them hipper. Uh, you know, if you if you you find that if you move yourself around like this, you'll be able to do this. Um, the same is true with fingers. You know, if somebody's got the fingering a little funny, rather than saying, "Hey, you, you, you got the finger," you take your fingers and you say, "Now move this down to this fret, move that down to that fret." It makes a big difference. So, as much as I love teaching. It needs to be done up to my standards. I have to be able to enjoy it as much as the student is. That's sort of my golden rule. Well, the last two questions here, we've probably touched at, mm-hmm. but I want, but I like this one. It says, so your LinkedIn okay. profile, uh, okay. I'm going to read it out here, <laughs> mentions nothing of you as a guitarist. You know why? Like nothing. There's a reason. Why? They'll either know me or they won't. And, <laughs> and since I do lots of things other than play guitar, If they're interested in any of the other things that I'm proposing on LinkedIn, then they might be inclined to invite me to participate in a project or ask me more questions about my qualifications, blah, blah, blah. Um, Right. I'm very, I'd like to think that I'm a fairly hip social media user. So even for the LinkedIn crowd, I'll put up a little, you know, a little cute little thing into the feed every once in a, once a month or something like that. And people will get, oh, yeah, it's that, it is that Elliot Randall, you know. So I'm cool with that. I do, you know, I mean, what it says in LinkedIn, if I remember correctly, it talks about me loving challenges and the human interaction. Well, it's true. You know, so whether it be music or whether it be design or whether it be multimedia, you know, let's go. I'm, I'm not that precious about, you know, Elliot, the guitar player. Yeah, it's one of the things that I do. It's been very, very good to me, and I'm really, you know, pleased as punch about it. But it's just a piece. I just thought it was fun. I'm glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so last but no means least, and I think we've probably covered this um, inside of the interview, but this is a great opportunity to to, to wrap it up. It's like, what are you up to at the moment? Um what are your plans and, you know, what are your ambitions? My ambitions are to, and these are my plans as well, to keep making interesting music. Um, music that isn't necessarily in the mainstream. I love, I love the avant-garde. I love synthesis. And I love making hit records as well. I mean, I really like doing something that, man, this I love that. I'm never going to forget that chorus ever. You know, so to me, there's this whole broad range. It's almost like being a painter. But rather than being a Rothko or a Noland or somebody whose style you really, really know, you know, like, oh, who did? he did? I can't believe he did that. You know, so I, there's a delight that I have in showing something that's brand new and original. What's, what a wonderful way to end up. Oh, great. great. I, I, I don't want this to be our, our second and last. Let's do some more. And I'm going to take you up on some lessons. Well, do that and get yourself over here. Come we'll come we'll hang out in the studio. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm dying to. As soon as uh, this uh, the old Dan Pemick 
yeah, has yeah. Uh, um, some of this confusion that's flying around at the moment has dissipated. It'll, um, it'll, it'll be cool. At some point, it'll, it'll cool itself out, I'm sure. One of the things that I learned that's most important in being a producer, one word, patience. I agree. I, one, of the, one of the things I've, I've talked about and I should talk about more and you will fully understand because you just summed it up, is like when you know the band are going to get where you want them to go and just keeping your mouth shut and letting them do it rather than putting your own ego in and pressing that button and go, you know, you really should go to the G there because you know they're going to figure it out and it's going to mm. be far more powerful for them to figure out where to go rather than you inserting yourself. And Absolutely. I didn't know that when I was a musician because I worked with a couple of the greatest music that producers that ever lived. And I couldn't understand why they weren't just directing me on every single thing that I was doing. Mm. And yet the results I got with them were always the best because they knew how to enhance us and elevate us. One of the unbelievable producers I worked for was a fellow called Don Covey, who produced and wrote some serious, serious R&B hits back in the 60s and 70s. Um, when Don would hire me, a, a young guy, you know, I came in playing too much, you know, and he would just say, Elliot, why don't you just chill out, man? Just give me a little something here. Stay away. Don't play nothing here. And then just give me two and four over there. And these were lessons that really brought me into where I needed to be. He was a very kindly guy. I, mean, I just have the warmest recollection of him. And it was just an important building block in my own development. So Elliot, thank you ever so much. You rock, blues, jazz, funk, R&B, you do it all. Thank you ever so much, my friend. We aim to please, and I look forward to seeing you again soon, Warren. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. And once again, Elliot, I really appreciate it. A real pleasure. Bye.